Hello, welcome to my channel. This is part two of my thrips on African violets video. In the previous episode, we ventured out thrips hunting in my garden, looked at their description, life cycle and behavior, saw the thrips infestation on African violets in action and inspected the damage they caused on my plants. Today, we'll talk about thrips management methods that are available. Then I'll show you how I treated thrips infestation on my plants and talk about prevention and lessons learned. There are different ways to manage thrips infestations, including non-chemical control, biological and cultural, and chemical control through insecticides. Each method has its own success rate and depends on the type of the growing space you have and the species of thrips you're dealing with. We'll skip the cultural control because it's mostly recommended for thrips management outdoors, and it is not applicable in our case to African violets grown indoors. Biological control can be effective for identifiable thrips species that have natural enemies by introducing beneficial insects to grow an environment. Chemical control through insecticides is advised if the thrips species cannot be identified or if biological control either is not available for the particular thrips species we're dealing with or when it is not 100% effective. Biological method includes predatory thrips, predatory mites, and certain parasitic wasps known to help control certain thrips species. The keyword here is certain thrips species. So it depends on whether we know the species of the thrips that had attacked our plants or we're not 100% sure. Ability to identify the species you're dealing with is critical for biological control. This will help decide whether the thrips species has natural enemies. Some of them do and others are not yet known. With greenhouse thrips, for example, a suspect in my case, the only one effective natural enemy known to attack them is larval parasite called Thripobius semiluteus. It kills thrips by parasitizing their larvae. Are there less effective natural enemies for greenhouse thrips management include an egg parasite, a tiny wasp called Megafragma mimaripendi, and three predatory thrips species, Franklinotrips, Orizabensis, Franklinotrips vespiformis, and Leptotrips mali. The challenge with biological control is threefold. First, can we identify the exact thrips species we're dealing with so we can select the proper natural enemy? Remember from part one, there are thousands of thrips species currently known. So identifying the thrips species you're dealing with can be a challenge. Next, if we can identify the thrips species that we're dealing with and if the natural enemy insect is available on the market for that particular thrips species, then are we comfortable to have the beneficial insects crawling around our home? And finally, what if the beneficial insects wind up not being 100% effective? If biological control doesn't help, then additional chemical treatment may be needed. Integrating both chemical and non-chemical methods is known as integrated pest management or IPM. If you use both biological and chemical control though, you need to be selecting chemical insecticides carefully because some of them may kill the predatory bugs too. For example, spinosad, effective for thrips, can be toxic to predatory mites as well. To keep things simple, I chose the chemical control route. Chemical insecticides can be systemic and non-systemic. Systemic insecticides are intended to kill thrips and other insects via ingestion of plant tissue contaminated from the inside over time, while non-systemics are designed to kill via contact with or ingestion of surface residues shortly after application. Systemic insecticides are considered to be more toxic. 
systemics work in a way that they are absorbed by one plant part, for example, by roots, and moved to other plant parts. They are usually sold in granular form, like the bonite systemic granules, and here they are up close. I put them in a separate container so you can take a look what they look like. And <clears throat> they kill insects by contact and ingestion when used as a soil treatment. So you add them to the soil. There are different kinds of systemic insecticides on the market, including neonicotinoids, such as bonide. I will be showing the insecticides that are available in the United States and other countries may have other insecticides available on the local markets. Imidacloprid, the active ingredient, is effective against both adult and larval stages of various thrip species. Although some pest management programs argue that imidacloprid commonly fails to provide satisfactory thrips control and generally is not recommended for thrips. For example, the University of California statewide integrated pest management program. I'll include a link to it in the description box. I prefer trusting the labels, so I just always use imidacloprid uh, in the bonite product to control thrips in the systemic control. This particular product, bonite systemic granules, contains a lower concentration of imidacloprid at 0.22%. There is also another insecticide variety with the same active ingredient, but more concentrated called Marathon at 1% of imidacloprid. Each of them calls for different dosage based on the active ingredient concentration. So less concentrated bonite systemic needs higher dosage of application and more concentrated Marathon needs lower dosage and the use in instructions are included on the label. Speaking of marathon systemic, I have a funny story to tell. When I was a new grower and I went shopping for insecticides for my African violets, I saw a product on the shelf that sounded similar to Marathon. And then I thought, well, maybe that's the one that they recommended and uh, I got it. It was called Melathian. And it turned out to be an, a concentrate recommended for outdoors. And when I used it indoors, it was a disaster. Uh, so I do not recommend it. It had a very strong chemical smell. So I recommend always looking at the active ingredient on the label. Non-systemic insecticides are considered to be less toxic. They are usually sold in a spray form. They are designed to kill via contact with or ingestion of the surface residues shortly after application of the spray. Some non-systemic insecticides do not leave toxic residues that kill natural enemies, and that's why they are considered to be beneficial, especially in the integrated pest management. When choosing non-systemic insecticide sprays to treat thrips infestations, make sure that thrips is included in the list of insects. Sometimes it's obvious, like here, for example, on uh, Captain Jack's insecticidal super soap, here we see thrips right there on the cover. And sometimes it's less obvious, for example, here in this Garden Insect Killer by Garden Safe, I think thrips are not listed here on the front, but if you read the booklet on the back, you will see that it is included in the full list of insects. Here, right after application instructions, we see the list of pests and thrips is listed at the very end almost, including greenhouse thrips. The active ingredients in non-systemic insecticides that are considered to be less toxic include natural plant oils, pyrethrins, potassium salts of fatty acids, and spinosad. Uh, for example, here we see in this product, uh, the active ingredient is extract of neem oil, and then three-in-one garden spray 
has more natural plant oils, thyme, geranium, cinnamon, and peppermint. Then this one here, tomato and vegetable spray, that also is um, affecting thrips. Tomato and vegetable, Captain Jack's, includes pyrethrins and sulfur. And this has a double action because it also uh, controls insects and fungal diseases. So it's a very helpful product to have if they're fungi. And then also here we see pyrethrins in the garden insect killer. And there are also products that include two different active ingredients, Captain Jack's insecticidal super soap because it includes spinosad, which is the most toxic out of the less toxic non-systemic insecticides, if it makes sense. So it includes spinosad and potassium salts of fatty acids here um, on the label. Spinosad can be toxic to certain natural enemies, for example, predatory mites. Uh, when sprayed and for about one day afterwards. It's known to last one week or more and moves short distances into sprayed tissue to reach thrips feeding in protected plant parts. So it's very effective uh, when uh, treating thrips infestations. And here's another Captain Jack's product. It's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug by Bonide and it has spinosad as the only active ingredient and i use this one in the course of treatment of thrips infestation thrips are known to develop resistance to active ingredients in non-systemic insecticides so when using non-systemics it is recommended to rotate chemicals with a different active ingredient to help prevent the development of resistance in my case, the thrips infestation symptoms were only visible in the living room area on the plants that were growing next to the windows. But to reduce risks, I treated not only the area where thrips infestation symptoms were present, but my entire collection, including plants in other rooms growing both on open shelves and in the enclosed propagation trays. To prepare for treatment, get the protection gear ready because the insecticides can be toxic and you need to protect yourself first. So wear gloves through all stages of treatment and facial mask when treating with non-systemic insecticide sprays. Step one, remove all plants from the growing area. I usually move mine to a bathroom for the spray treatment. Step two, Discard and dispose of all severely damaged plants as soon as possible. The ones that you will see on this video were discarded immediately. Discarding severely damaged plants will stop them from spreading thrips to other plants in your collection. Treat salvageable plants only. These are the plants that still have some undamaged leaves in the center of the crown. So for example here, and this one has been treated for several weeks now, the central leaves still look healthy. They don't have the thrips damage, unlike the lower leaves that have some damage from the larvae feeding on foliage. After removing all affected plants from the growing area, I cleaned all surfaces with alcohol sanitizer spray and the bleach based solutions can also be used for cleaning. To reuse pots in which the affected plants were growing, I usually clean them with 10% bleach solution and then I place them in boiling water for 10 minutes to make sure all eggs of thrips or uh, other stages are killed uh, by submerging them in the boiling water. To start treating salvageable plants, first thing I do, I remove all flowers or flower buds. And here we have a few on this particular plant. And um, 
some insecticides have a disclaimer on the label addressing this, the need to remove the flowers and flower buds. For example, Marathon has a note on the label that its active ingredient, imidacloprid, suppresses thrips on foliage only. So those that are inside of the buds or flowers, Marathon label says will not be suppressed. That's why it's important to remove the flowers and flower buds. Next step is remove all damaged leaves and immediately dispose of them because they can still have some of the um, larvae on them or eggs. Now make sure to inspect the leaves that need to be removed. So this um, leaf, for example, on top surface looks healthy. But when you look on the underside surface, you still see some bites of the thrips larvae. So remove everything that has the signs of damage. And finally, I will remove this leaf here and I'll show you why. Here we see some damage present. When you zoom in, you can clearly see it. So it means that there were eggs on top that hatched and then the larvae crawling under the surface of the leaf made all this damage. And so we don't know if there is more eggs present on this leaf. Uh, so we need to remove it as soon as possible. And then the rest of the foliage looks fine. It looks damage free. So we will keep the center here, the center of the crown and use it for repotting. But first, we'll give it the first non-systemic insecticide spray treatment. When treating the plant, make sure that you treat both the underside surface of the leaf and the top surface. I usually do it in the bathroom and I leave the plants to dry overnight because the light exposure is not recommended immediately after treatment because it can leave the burn marks on the leaf surface. In this case, I used the Captain Jack's tomato and vegetable insecticide spray with pyrethrins as the active ingredient, and it is known to be effective for thrips infestation treatment. Then I repeated steps five through seven on all plants. I removed all flowers and flower buds, I removed and disposed of all damaged leaves, and I treated all the plants with the insecticide spray. After that, they were ready for repotting with systemic insecticide once they've dried out overnight. To repot with systemic granules, I added the bonite systemic granules to my potting mix according to the instructions on the label. Two and a half tablespoons per gallon of potting mix. Here is another plant that I had sprayed previously to make sure it dries before repotting. And the before you repot, make sure to inspect the leaves that appeared healthy upon first inspection. Sometimes the symptoms are not immediately visible on first inspection, but then after the first insecticide spray, they may appear overnight, like this leaf, for example. It appeared perfectly healthy at first, before the first spray. But after the first spray, it developed those symptoms. So make sure to remove everything that has signs of damage, especially on the underside. Yeah, so this one here has a little bit, but still we're gonna remove it before repotting. Remove as much of the original potting mix as possible. It's easier to do when you let the potting mix dry a little bit. Because the prepupal and pupal stages of many thrips species live in soil, uh, it's important that we remove as much of the old potting mix as possible. And then sometimes I even um, rinse the root ball in water. And then once you've rinsed it up, Hopefully it removes the leftover of the pupae or the pre-pupae stages, whatever lives in soil in the thrips. 
species life cycle that we talked about in part one and then pet dry with paper towel. And now it's ready to be repotted into the fresh potting mix. Uh, to repot on the wick, I use a piece of the paper towel on the bottom above the wick here so that it prevents the potty mix from dropping down into the water. And I will include a link to the potty mix video in the description box. Uh, it's mostly Promix BX and Perlite and sometimes I use Sphagnum peat moss if I run short on Promix BX. And sometimes I even add a little bit extra of bonite systemic on the bottom, like so. And this is when we repot the plant that has been treated once with in insecticide, the root ball rinsed in water, and then you pet it dry, you loosen the roots a little bit, and then you place them like so loosely in the pot. And then you fill it up with the rest of the pot and mix, right? Like so. Usually I don't uh, compact the potty mix. I fill it up very loosely to make sure that the, the potty mix has plenty of air pockets for the healthy root growth. And the potty mix goes all the way up um, to the top of the stem, but not to cover the center of the crown. like so. Then I water it gently here at, on the edge of the potty mix, not to get the water in the center, to make sure that the weak capillary action starts working. The wick was already pre-soaked. That usually works well. And then off it goes onto the clean shelves, awaiting for the next week's treatment. The final step involves continuing insecticide spray treatment for several weeks to break the thrips life cycle. Remember to rotate insecticides with different active ingredients in each treatment to prevent insecticide resistance. In my case, I used two active ingredients and I rotated them each week. One is the pyrethrins and it's available in Captain Jack's Tomato and Vegetable and Garden Insect Killer by Garden Safe. They have the same active ingredient pyrethrins. And then, so I used, one week I used one of these, and then the next week I used Spinosad, which is available in Captain's Jack Dead Bug. adult species of thrips invading your home is a slowly moving species like greenhouse thrips, it is possible to detect and treat the adults right away with a single contact insecticide application and then repotting them with a the systemic. But this of course is the ideal case scenario. In real life, 
Adult drips can usually go undetected until we start seeing either spilled pollen on blooms or larvae feeding on leaves and the resulting plant damage. The latter means that the first generation of eggs has already hatched and the undetected adult thrips keeps laying new eggs daily. This is when we go to plan B. If the adult thrips remains undetected, it can continue to lay eggs for as long as it lives in your home. For example, female adult western flower thrips lives up to 30 days and lays two to 10 eggs per day. Various thrip species can live from 30 to 45 days. The greenhouse thrips adults, for example, can live seven weeks on plants growing in the greenhouse. Based on the appearance of the plant damage, in my case, I'm pretty sure mine were greenhouse thrips. So it means that I had to continue the treatment for the seven weeks for the duration of the lifetime of the greenhouse thrips adults and then plus additional two to five days for the last eggs to hatch. So it means that the duration of my treatment would be about eight weeks total. If you are uncertain about the thrips species you're dealing with, the safest would be to treat for the longest known thrips lifespan, 45 days plus five days for the last eggs to hatch, which means about 50 days total. Thrips can be difficult to control effectively with insecticides at all stages. Adults are difficult to reach because in most species they move fast and can fly. Eggs and pupil stages are difficult to reach because they are non-feeding stages, so they will not ingest the insecticide. They are also protected from the insecticide reach. Eggs are often deposited inside plant tissue, prepupal and pupil stages often develop in soil. So most insecticides will only work to kill the stages that are actively feeding and are in immediate reach. In our case, it is the thrips larvae. This means that we need to calculate the treatment frequency based on the larval stages window, which is about three to eight days. If we repeat insecticide spray treatments, say about every seven days for as long as the undetected mother thrips leaves, we have a good chance of eradicating all offspring at the larval stages. Provided that no additional thrips get inside of our homes in the meantime, this should work. As far as prevention, there are two schools of thought here. Some growers treat new plants with insecticides upon arrival before placing them in quarantine, and others prefer not to use insecticides until the first symptoms of infestation become visible to prevent pest resistance to insecticides. The problem with the latter is that by the time the infestation symptoms are noticeable to human eye, it is likely that the infestation had not just started, but is already going on in full swing. When I realized that my plants were attacked by thrips this summer, treating my entire collection has turned into a very time-consuming task. And so if I can avoid this in the future, it will save me lots of time. This is why I will continue treating new plants and repot them with systemic granules upon arrival. For prevention, I plan on using the following strategies. Being able to detect an infestation at the earliest possible stage will give the best chance at full recovery. I will continue inspecting my main collection regularly for signs of infestation as discussed in part one. Using zoom feature on my phone has turned to be very helpful because they're often invisible to human eye. I will be checking not only blooms for spilled pollen and top surface of the leaves, for larvae and damage, but also the underside surface of the leaves. In my case, what helped me discover the adult thrips was the plant with large thin foliage, and it was not an African violet, it was the geranium that was growing on the window fa facing the rose bush outside.
having a plan like this can be helpful in detecting the first adult trips that have gotten into your home from outside. I may also be using the yellow sticky cards to help monitor my plans for future invasions. I will continue to quarantine all new incoming plants to reduce risk of new infestations. Because thrips are so opportunistic and can get inside any time, especially during the warm season, I will keep testing new arrivals for INSV while in quarantine and disposing of positively tested plants. This way, in case new thrips manage to get in in the future, at least there will be no INSV infected plants waiting for them from which they can easily spread the virus to others. I test the incoming new plants for INSV using EGDIA test kits, and I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly, but I'll include a caption on, on the video. There are already a few good videos available on YouTube that you can check out to see how the test is performed. I plan on keeping plants toxic for thrips and other bugs at all times using chemical control, reapplying systemic granules in the soil every eight weeks, and using non-systemic foliar insecticide sprays every month. As far as toxicity levels, I will use Lex Toxic Non-Systemics monthly, and then twice a year I will use more toxic Spinosad, this product here, uh, Captain Jack's Dead Bug, and also this one here. It's a mix of Spinosad and potassium salts of fatty acids, and it's called Captain Jack's Insecticidal Super Soap by Bonide. And of course, I will make sure to rotate active ingredients in each treatment to prevent pest resistance to insecticide. I've learned a lot from this experience. Thrips are common insects living outdoors and in greenhouses. Thrips are very opportunistic and can get indoors in many different ways. Not all thrip species are created equal. There are thousands of thrip species currently known. Monitor your collection for early detection. Being able to detect an infestation at the earliest possible stage will give the best chance at full recovery. Quarantine new plants and treat them as if they had drips or other insects. Repot with systemic and use insecticide spray to treat larvae and leaves. Removing all blooms from African violets during systemic treatment is important because imidacloprid, when mixed in soil, does not suppress thrips living inside buds and flowers. Removing all blooms from African violets will not starve thrips to death because the larvae will happily feed on leaves. Thrips and other infestations can happen to anyone at any time. It is likely that houseplant lovers can experience thrips infestations at least once. Treat it as part of the growing hobby. Reducing collection size will help make the treatments less time consuming and more manageable. Another way to enjoy your collection without having to treat your plants with chemicals is to grow them in the enclosed terrariums, such as this Rob's Waskali rabbit growing in a bubble garden. I hope you found this video helpful. This is my main collection room, six weeks into the treatment, looking nice and clean and I hope they stay this way. Day breaks and I'm burned by the morning light. I make the same mistake more than twice. Same song, a brand new dance. I wear out my third second chance. The facts, the best me is with you, but I know I got a lot to prove. They think we're too damaged to fix, but we're just working through a little rust.